Welcome, everyone. My name is Dr. Laura Cohen, and I'm the Executive Director of the Harriet and Kenneth Kupferberg Holocaust Center at Queensborough Community College at the City University of New York in Bayside, Queens. Our mission is to use the lessons of the Holocaust to educate current and future generations about the ramifications of prejudice, racism, and stereotyping. The Kupferberg Holocaust Center in Bayside, New York, is situated on the traditional land of the Mantinecock people who continue to live here today. We offer gratitude and respect to all of the people of, of Turtle Island, past, present, and future, including the Lenape and Shinnecock peoples. What I just read is what we call a land acknowledgement. This is a statement recognizing that the land we all occupy in the course of our daily lives, including our schools, jobs, parks, and homes, as well as the names of towns and roads, were first inhabited by another group of people who continue to live here today. These horrors continue to have devastating economic, political, social, and environmental impacts upon and within Native American and Indigenous communities. Today's event, Gendered Aspects of the LGBTQIA Plus Experiences During the Holocaust, features a conversation between Dr. Danny Sexton, Associate Professor of English at Queensborough Community College, and Dr. Jake Newsom, a public historian of the LGBTQIA plus past and author of the forthcoming book, Pink Triangle Legacies, coming out in the shadow of the Holocaust. Dr. Sexton and Dr. Newsom's talk is part of the KHC's 2021 National Endowment for the, for the Humanities Colloquium entitled Incarceration, Transformation, and Paths to Liberation During the Holocaust and Beyond. It's also connected to the KHC's newest exhibition, The Concentration Camps, Inside the Nazi System of Incarceration and Genocide. Today's event is organized by the KHC in partnership with the CUNY LGBTQ Plus Consortium at Queensborough Community College. It's co-sponsored by the Holocaust, Genocide, and Interfaith Education Center at Manhattan College, the Ray Walpaw Institute at Western Washington University, the Center for the Study of Genocide and Human Rights at Rutgers University, the Nancy and David Wolf Holocaust and Humanity Center, the LGBTQ Resource Center at the College of Staten Island, and the Center for Jewish Studies at Queens College. Today's conversation focuses on the different gendered experiences of gay men, lesbian, and trans people in the period preceding World War II, the Holocaust, and the years that followed. It comes at a particularly difficult moment in our culture when even the mere mention of the word gay or anything related to LGBTQIA issues are being debated in Florida, while the human rights of young trans people and their parents are being actively challenged in Texas. Today's discussion will bring these parallels between the past and the present to light helping us understand that when the basic human rights of one group of people to even to exist are under siege, we're all at risk. Two more quick notes. This event's be recorded so you can watch it later and please be sure to submit your questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Now to kick things off, I'd like to introduce Dr. Azade Alai. She's this year's KHC NEH faculty fellow and associate professor of psychology at Queensborough Community College. Dr. Alai's research interests focus on Holocaust education, the psychology of bystander behavior during the Holocaust, and the intersection of mass media, violence, warfare, and genocide. Dr. Alai, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Laura. I'm just going to start by thanking both of our speakers for their time and offering a brief uh, introduction to them. So Dr. Danny Sexton, we're lucky to have on our campus here. He's an associate professor of English whose research focuses on gender, masculinities, and queer studies, as well as Victorian and African-American literature and culture. He has published on issues of race, gender, masculinity, and pedagogy, and presented at numerous conferences. His two current long-term projects are first, an examination of both actual and literary representations of all Black towns and communities, and second, an examination of how views of American masculinity were and are challenged and transformed by the 1980s AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power and the current Black Lives Matters movement. Dr. Jake Newsom is an award-winning scholar of German and American LGBTQ plus history, whose research and resources educate global audiences. As was mentioned by Dr. Cohen, his forthcoming book, Pink Triangle Legacies, Coming Out in the Shadows of the Holocaust, chronicles the ongoing struggle for the acknowledgement and memorialization of the Nazis LGBTQ plus victims. It also traces the transformation of the pink triangle 
from a concentration camp badge in Nazi Germany into a symbol of queer activism, pride, and community beginning in the 1970s. In addition to serving as a historical advisor for film projects, podcasts, and plays, Dr. Newsom has been invited by the French, UK, and US governments to speak about the important lessons that LGBTQ plus history has for all of us today. And he now works at a museum profession as a museum professional in Washington, DC. Um, Dr. Sexton, I'm going to give you the floor. And I just actually realized as we're doing the introductions, maybe you can start by sharing for everyone what um, the acronyms and LGBTQIA plus stand for, because not everyone in our audience might be as familiar with what comes after the Q. So that could be a good starting point for us. Thank you, Aziz. Um, so, uh, so let's begin with that terminology. Um, so L is lesbian, G is gay, B is bisexual, um, Q is queer, T is transsexual, I is intersex, um, and then A is asexual. Um, so those are those um, terminology. And actually, I wanted to begin also by just speaking about terminology in general. Um, so particularly the terms homosexuality and homosexual. Um, much in the same way that men have been used historically to refer to all humans, homosexual or homosexuality until recently have been used when it comes to speaking of same-sex desire. However, as we know, the seemingly all-inclusive man or homosexual does not include all, even if it purports to do so. Think of the preamble to the American Declaration of Independence uh, that begins with, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Uh, we know historically that the all men and the lived experience of individuals of that time period did not include women or Blacks. Returning to the issue of same-sex desire immediately before, during, and after the Holocaust, the umbrella term of queer to identify those who do not follow heritage normative ideas of sex action and gender performances seems a more inclusive term to use. However, in the time period in which we are covering, much of the literature, both firsthand accounts and scholarship, use homosexual men and lesbians. The reason being is that there was a distinct difference between how homosexual men and lesbian, lesbians lived their lives and were persecuted under the Nazis. By and large, most were men, which had much to do with notions of masculinity and the subordinate position of women. In terms of the transgender perspectives of the Holocaust, we run into difficulties because the way in which we now define and recognize transgender people is very different than in the past. In fact, the problematic term most often used then was transvestite, coined by Magnus Hirschfeld, who I will speak about later uh, in this presentation. A transvestite was someone who habitually, habitually wore clothes of the opposite sex. Often in firsthand accounts and scholarship of, of the period, the phrase cross-dresser will be used also. And while Hirschfeld had coined the term tra transvestite, he was not totally satisfied with it because he believed that clothing was only an outward sign of a deeper and richer psychological state. Today, we would commonly use trans to identify those types of queer, yet notable trans scholars have argued that transvestite was the closest term to what we now view as trans and that we should not completely jettison this term when we write of trans history. Um, so queer life, in the years preceding Hitler and the rise of the Nazi party in Germany was very rich. Uh, towards the end of World War I, the German Empire fell and was replaced with the Weimar Republic, which lasted from November 8, 1918 until January 30, 1933, when Adolf Hitler was appointed chancellor. While the Weimar Republic faced a number of political and economic crises in its short 15 years, it was also a period that as my co-presenter, Dr. Newsom has described as quote, an incubator for new social movements and ideas where attitudes towards sex changed 
and generally became characterized by a greater degree of openness to the discussions of sex itself and the diverse human expressions of human sexuality. It was a period that epitomizes what we think of when we think of queer theory. There was a shift in the view towards understanding sexuality. No longer was it thought of as something that one simply does, a behavior, but there was a realization that it was something that one is, an identity. And while sexual relationships between homosexual men was still a crime in Weimar Germany under paragraph 175, and I'll return to paragraph 175 later as well, in many of the German urban centers, there was an emerging and thriving queer landscape where individuals who were attracted to members of the same sex enjoyed a certain degree of tolerance, if not full acceptance, as they carved out visible spaces for themselves in public. By the early 1920s, there were over 100 bars, cafes, and nightclubs in Berlin alone that catered either exclusively to homosexual men and lesbians or at least provided a supported environment. Yet these queer spaces were also gendered ones. By far the most famous queer nightclub in Weimar Berlin was the El Dorado, identified mainly as a transvestite club. And what I like to do is I like to show you a well-known image. The photo caption for the image is a scene from a nightclub at El Dorado, and um, there's the photo credit. And I have a larger image of that as well. So here you can see uh, more detail of it. One aspect of this photograph that has always intrigued me is the captioning that it has received over the years. Among them have been the following, lesbians dancing at a Berlin El Dorado club, transgender women dancing at the El Dorado, a couple dancing at the El Dorado. And as you look at the photograph, which I'm now providing the larger image of, the individuals could be all or none of these identities. Um, so that's just a um, context to frame there. And it's more like in the Q&A, if people want to go back and talk about these photographs, we can in more details. Thanks to the Weimar Republic's abolishment of official censorship, there was a dramatic increase in the number of magazines, journals, and newsletters that were written by and for homosexuals, thus creating networks to which queer people could identify and interact with others, thus nurturing a sense of belonging and establishing gradually a sense of community. Claudia Schopenhauer in her The Days of Masquerade, Life Stories of Lesbians During the Third Reich, reports that, quote, the freedom of the press enjoyed during the Weimar Republic enabled the printing of queer publications with the combined circulations in the millions. Um, and here I like to share um, one, uh, and this is an advertisement for the Ladies Club by uh, Violetta. Um, and there's a larger image of that. Um, uh, this is a club frequent by lesbians in uh, Berlin. Um, one other photo that I like to share, um, two homosexual friends posed on the beach, um, larger photo uh, there for you. Um, these are just a small collection of photographs that survived. There were many more, but many of them were destroyed when the Nazis came to power and decided to attack the new sexual freedoms that were being gained during the Weimar Republic. What we do have, however, documents the richness of queer life, but once again in gender aspects. I have looked through a number of photographs from the period, and rarely do I see many that show mixed queer identities. That El Dorado one is a exception. Uh, the abolishment of official citizenship also allowed sex reformers and sexologists to openly discuss their research and views. Work that had begun during the German Empire. Uh, in fact, the first known uh, print use of the term homosexual appeared in 1869 in a German pamphlet. Um, on May 14, 1897, 1897 Magnus Hirschfeld founded the Scientific Humanitarian Community, abbreviated SHC, um, that adopted the motto, Through Science, Justice. Hirschfeld and fellow members believe that scientific research together with public education would affect a dramatic cultural reassessment of homosexuality within Germany, leading eventually to acceptance and legal reform. And one of the main goals of the HSC was to repeal a paragraph 175 of the German 
criminal code, which made homosexual activities between men punishable. Uh, and just some background information here. In 1875, with the unification of the German states, Wilhelm I, who had been the King of Prussia, who was made the first German emperor, that year, paragraph 175, based on a Prussian code dating back to 1794, was adopted for the new German empire. The German code, which was essentially the Prussian one, read, quote, an unnatural sex act committed between persons of the male sex or by humans with animals is punishable by imprisonment. The laws of civil rights might also be imposed. While the SHC came close a few times to repealing or revising paragraph 175 so that it would have legalized homosexual activities between consenting adults, and I should say male consenting adults, it was never successful. And the Nazis would later use it as the basis for their persecution of homosexual men. In addition to, the, to his work towards repealing paragraph 175, Magnus Hirschfeld was a significant figure in terms of trans history. Uh, in 1919, he founded the Institute of Sex Research, a privately operated research space for the studies of human sexuality that housed a very large archive of books and journals, estimated somewhere between 12,000 to 20,000, and of images, at least 5,000, but some sources report that there were many more. The Institute was one of the first medical facilities that could provide gender affirmation surgeries, and Hirschfeld coined the term transsexual. He was instrumental in issuing and in getting the Weimar German police to accept what were called transvestite passes, which granted the person to wear clothing which corresponded to their gender identity and not their biological sex. Um, and here is an example of one of those certificates. And uh, this is just a little bit larger, uh, so you get a better sense of it. It reads, translated from the German, Eva Cater is in clinical terms of transvestite. To maintain her mental well-being and her ability to work, it is necessary that she is able to wear clothing of the male gender, which corresponds to her nature. So while there were a greater, I mean, so you see like during this time period, there was these, this uh, radical change in terms of sexuality uh, and how uh, we were thinking about it or how they were thinking about it at the time. But while there was greater freedom and tolerance of queerness in Berlin and other larger cities, it was not a gay utopia. Uh, Gertrude Sandman, a Jewish lesbian in her mid twenties during this time period, warned of misplaced nostalgia about the level of acceptance queers enjoyed during the Weimar Republic. Numerous anti-homosexual pamphlets were published as well as organizations and clubs that worked to undermine any gains that had been made. Furthermore, paragraph 175 remained. In fact, the average number of annual paragraph 175 convictions rose during the Weimar area, whereas an average of 207 men had been convicted per year during the German Empire, the number of annual convictions, um, convictions more than doubled during the Weimar Republic to 530. Arising out of the short-lived German Workers' Party, the National Socialist German Workers' Party, otherwise known as the Nazi Party, was created in 1920. Anti-homosexual sentiments had never been a central pillar of National Socialist ideology in the years leading to the Nazis' elections. But the party leadership had made its position on the issue clear on multiple occasions. In 1928, before the Reichstag's elections, Hirschfeld's SHC had distributed a questionnaire to all political parties asking their stance on paragraph 175. The Nazi party responded with the following, quote, whoever so much as thinks of male, male, or female, female love is our enemy. We are opposed to everything that, em that emasculates our people, making it a plaything of the enemy. This is why we oppose illicit sexual acts above all male male love, because it robs us of our last chance to liberate our people from the chains of slavery under which it now suffers. This statement makes clear that the party is most concerned about male male love, and that it has much to do with outdated views of sexuality that Hirschfeld and others were trying to combat. Importance is placed on the male gender because it is seen as dominant, 
active, representative, and intrinsically linked to nation. The Nazi discourse on sexuality was very much in line with the discourse on sexuality in other countries, such as the UK and the USA at the time. While women are needed to populate the nation, the belief is that they operate in a submissive and passive capacity and didn't have a sexuality. Here we can think of the work of Adrian Rich and her explanation of compulsory heterosexuality in which she argues and demonstrates how heterosexuality has been forcefully and subliminally imposed on women. Once Hitler was appointed chancellor in January 1933, the Nazi party swiftly and decisively began to roll back any progress towards sexual freedom and liberation under the Weimar Republic. In February, the Nazis launched a purge of the queer clubs in Berlin, sex publications were outlawed, and organized groups were banned. On May 6 of 1933, Magnus Hirschfeld Institute of Sex Research was sacked by the German Student Union. Um, and then on May 10, together with confiscated collections from all over the city, the contents of the library were burned. So a lot of those archives and books and images that were collected at that institute have been lost. Um, a later strike against the queer freedoms that had been ushered in under the Weimar Republic occurred on what is known as the Night of the Long Knives, which occurred from June 30th to July 2nd, 1934. Sometimes referred to as the Rome Purge, it was a series of political extrajudicial executions to consolidate Hitler's power and to alleviate concerns about other party leaders had concerning Ernst Röhm. Röhm, a known homosexual, had been a member of the original Germans Workers' Party and a close friend and ally of Hitler. Hitler had personally requested that Röhm serve as the chief of staff of the SA, the Nazis' official parliamentary wing. In this capacity, Rome and the SA gained considerable power, which did not sit well with other Nazi party leaders, particularly Heinrich Heim Heimler. The SS, originally an adjunct to the SA, was placed under the leadership of Himmler to restrict the power of the SA, and particularly Rome, who Hitler had begun to perceive as a threat to his own leadership. At the end of the Night of the Lone Knives, Rome and many other leaders of the SA, a number of whom were openly homosexual men, such as Rome's deputy, Edmund Hines, were executed. Jeffrey Giles argues that it was only after the Rome purge that Hitler began to show an active disgust of homosexuals. After the purge became widely known, despite efforts to cover it up, on July 9th, 19, Hitler justified the purge in a nationally broadcast speech to the Reichstag. He stated, in this hour, I was responsible for the fate of the German people, and thereby I became the supreme judge of the German people. I gave the order to shoot the ringleaders in this treason, and I further gave the orders to catarize down to the raw flesh the ulcers of this poisoning of the wells in our domestic life. Let the nation know that its existence, which depends on its internal order and security, cannot be threatened with impunity by anyone. So what stands out in this, in this statement is this, this way Hitler saw homosexuality in the SA kind of like an attack on domestic life, and that this was done to get rid of that. For Giles, the mastermind behind the Nazi pers uh, persecution of, of homosexuals uh, was Himmler, who became one, who became one of the most powerful men within the Nazi Party. Himmler kept a diary, and when he was twenty, he recorded his, re his reactions to it. So a lot of this comes from Himmler, um, and we can also see the influence of Himmler's views and statements that Hitler makes in the party press um, after the purge. Uh, Hitler writes, I would especially like every mother to be able to offer her son to the SA, the party, or to Hitler, a uh, youth without the fear that he might become morally or sexually deprived. I therefore request all SA officers to pay scrupulous attention to the fact that misdemeanors, according to paragraph 175, are to result in the immediate dismissal of those guilties from the SA and party. Um, so, you can kind of you, you see this fear um, taken on there. And this is why 
there was this attack on homosexuality. Um, and homosexuality then was not understood as simply a moral transgression. It was much more egregious threat to the future of the Germanic race itself. Second, men who saw sexual pleasures from other men were construed as weak and their alleged feminine demeanor denoted an inversion of their natural masculine gender. This meant that homosexual men contained a propensity to renounce their rightful position as leaders of their families, the, con the economy, and most importantly, the nation, since leadership was envisioned as a masculine role. Now that male homosexuality had been declared a threat on numerous fronts, the party needed a way to identify and remove these men who were not actively participating for the good of the nation. It was a problem because it was much more difficult to stigmatize and segregate homosexual men and women as compared to other ethical minorities or political adversaries. The commonly held worldview at the time to which a number of Nazi party's leaders subscribed was that homosexuality was not an inborn generic trait. It was instead a set of actions or vice. To make it easier to identify and criminalize these men, the Ministry of Justice greatly revised paragraph 175. The ministry also reconsidered if female homosexuality should be criminalized. As stated earlier, the Nazis held the view that women either did not possess a sexuality of their own, or if they did, it depended upon male stimulation. Sexual desire among women posted, posted, posed no serious lasting threat to the German folk, since it was assumed that lesbian women would be naturally drawn back towards heterosexual sex when a man came calling. Only a few cases in which lesbians were part persecuted has been documented since most of these women would have been labeled as asocial or political instead of homosexual. Claudia Chopin notes that there's no systematic persecutions of lesbians that were comparable to the persecution of gay men. Most les lesbians were spared a fate in the camps if they were not in danger for other reasons and if they were willing to conform. Um, in the days of masquerade, um, Chopin gives 10 firsthand accounts of les lesbian experiences of the Holocaust. However, most of these stories are not one of direct camp life. While some will mention being in the camps, we do not often get the detail we find in homosexual male accounts of the camps. These lesbian accounts of the Holocaust center mainly on living in constant fear of being found out. In terms of the lesbian experience, there's still much work that needs to be done and uncovered. And when it comes to trans experiences of the camps, we face a similar vacuum as we do to the lesbian ones. Um, and I wish to remind uh, you that during this period, there was not our modern understanding of transgender identities. Um, and in the 1930s and 40s, the world's word transvestite um, and now cross-dressing, which itself presented the threat to Nazi ideology. Um, so we, we have that problem there as well when it comes to um, trans identities. Um, and oftentimes uh, what would happen is that male to female transvestites would get a uh, loop locked in with the homosexuals and female to male transvestites would get locked into treatments of lesbians. Um, when it comes to homosexual experience of the counts, we have much more material available for us. And paragraph 175, uh, that revision of paragraph 175 opened up the doors for further persecution. Um, one of the primary goals of the Nazis campaign against same-sex activities were re-education, um, where um, in 1940, Himmler ordered that brothels be set up in camps um, that supplied by workers from one of the women's camps um, recorded, in, indicates that some of these women were lesbians. Um, homosexual men were scheduled for mandated visits to the camp brothels. Um, so that was one of the ways that um, the Nazis tried to address this threat with homosexual men. Uh, another one was through medical experiments, uh, such as castration. Um, and so you have a lot of those accounts. And as I stated before, we have much more accounts of homosexual men experiences of the camps than we do of lesbians and trans people. Uh, that's not to say that they, they, they do not exist, but we just need to do more work to uncover that. Um, so I'm going to stop here. Uh, and turn it over to Dr. Jake Newsom, who will continue on with the period 
after the Holocaust. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks, Danny, for that. And, and thanks to all of the um, organizers and uh, the sponsors and co-sponsors for putting this event together. It's really, uh, <clears throat> sorry, an, an honor to be speaking with all of you here this afternoon. So what I would like to do is essentially pick up where Dr. Sexton uh, left off um, at the end of the Holocaust and, and look how uh, gender also shaped memories of what the Nazis did to LGBTQ folks uh, during the era of the Holocaust. Dr. Sexton spoke, you know, really um, uh, nicely about how the, you know, uh, the Nazi regime was not only interested in uh, understanding and controlling sexuality, but the, in the ways in which uh, gender also influenced um, how LGBTQ Germans experienced uh, the, the Nazi regime. Uh, and those same types of uh, understandings of gender also impacted how uh, LGBTQ folks experienced the moment of liberation and the years after the Holocaust as well. So immediately after the war was over, um, the Allies had to first ascertain what to do with the hundreds of thousands of concentration camp survivors who were now in their care. Um, the, the men with the pink triangle, um, Dr. Sexton mentioned uh, men who were sent to concentration camps for being gay. They were marked uh, on their prisoner uniform with a pink triangle, which labeled them as, as a gay prisoner. Um, the U.S. military um, released, or not, sorry, not just the U.S. military, all allied military um, uh, militaries released uh, the concentration camp prisoners who were imprisoned because of racial or political or religious persecution. Um, but the policy was for any uh, concentration camp prisoner who was imprisoned uh, under so-called um, criminal codes, uh, to be transferred to local prisons. So because gay men had violated a national law, paragraph 175, the Allies considered them to be criminals rather than victims. Uh, and so uh, any, any gay pink triangle uh, survivor who still had a, any time left on his prison sentence uh, was transferred from a local from a concentration camp to a local prison to serve out the rest of his term. Now, during this time, the Nazis, uh, sorry, the Allies also implemented a system of uh, denazification in which they sought to, uh, you know, get rid of any laws um, that the Nazis had passed in Germany. But when it came time to, um, when they announced the list of uh, the laws that would be taken off the books, paragraph 175 was not on the list. So when East and West Germany uh, were created in 1949, both of these countries had the, the Nazi version of paragraph 175 written into their criminal codes. Um, interestingly, and, and perhaps if we have time in the Q&A, we can talk about it, the uh, East German government, within a matter of months of, of uh, you know, becoming established, got rid of the Nazi version of the law and went back to that original 1871 version. Uh, but West Germany, um, kept the, the Nazi version of paragraph 175, uh, which as you might imagine, um, spurred a number of uh, you know, appeals to have paragraph 175 uh, taken off the books, um, especially uh, amongst uh, uh, Germany's gay population. Um, they were arguing that we just went through a war and you know, were liberated by the allies uh, in this this fight uh, for you know personal um, personal dignity and personal liberty, so how is it possible that we as a new democracy can continue um, uh, defending the use of a fascist Nazi law here in this new this new government? Uh, but all of these appeals were struck down by the German court system, the West German court system, and in 1957. The Federal Constitutional Court, which is essentially West Germany's high court, um, uh, their Supreme Court, if you will, uh, announced that uh, once and for all that the Nazi version of paragraph 175 would be kept, uh, that it did not violate the new constitution of the West German state, uh, and added that it was, quote, still necessary to protect the moral fortitude of the German people. So West Germany not only 
um, decided to keep the Nazi version of paragraph 175. They actually enforced it uh, with, you know, with zeal. Um, and so if you look at this chart here, you see this is the chart of the number of annual convictions under paragraph 175 throughout Germany. You can see this, you know, really significant uh, uh, spike during the Nazi period. It falls again uh, during the war years and the occupation years. But then once West Germany is reestablished in 1949, the number of convictions rises again. And in fact, in the first 20 years alone, of West Germany's existence, uh, the Federal Republic arrested over 100,000 uh, gay men with the Nazi version of a law, ultimately convicting nearly 60,000 of those. So in a very powerful quotation after the war was over, um, Pierre Ciel, who was a uh, Frenchman who was arrested and sent to a concentration camp during the war for being gay, uh, stated quite powerfully that liberation was only for others. Now, during the process of compensation uh, of the Nazis' victims, which in German is called Wiedergutmachung, literally a making good again, um, all of the, uh, the, the gay men who were arrested under paragraph 175 were told that they you know, were not eligible for compensation because they were criminals and not officially as victims. And this can, this discussion about the you know worthiness of whether or not uh, LGBTQ folks and especially gay men were worthy of compensation uh, really lasted from the 1950s, 60s, and well into the 70s. But in 1969, uh, West Germany um, amended paragraph 175. Finally, they got rid of the Nazi version um, and legalized. Uh, same-sex activity amongst men over the age of 21. Uh, and so this age of consent was actually much higher than the age of consent for, for straight Germans. Um, but at the end of the day, it was, uh, it was a level of progress, um, which allowed the opening of a kind of cultural space in which a, a gay liberation movement uh, emerged in West Germany, again, in the late 60s and early 1970s. Uh, during this period, uh, the issue of coming out, right? the, the idea of visibility, of making one's uh, gayness visible to the, to the public became not just a personal decision, but a political act. Uh, and so here, what you can see on your screen are examples of what in German um, is called Tunten, uh, which translates in English um, as essentially as fairies or as Nancys. Uh, and so these were members of the gay liberation movement who were, uh, who were self-identified as gay men, uh, but who were essentially gender non-conforming. Um, and so they used their gender non-conformity very explicitly as a political tactic because there were emerged kind of these different factions in the gay rights movement in Germany at the time, uh, some of which who said, uh, well, we really just need to not make a big deal about being gay and just try to work within the system, um, gain society's approval, and then, then they will change all of these laws to make it easier on folks. Uh, on the other hand, were these folks known as the Tunten who said, that's easy for you to say, um, we live openly, you know, we, we visibly man uh, manifest our difference. Um, and we show just how limited West German society's uh, uh, acceptance or tolerance really is. Because when you uh, look different, especially when you, you know, play with the traditional gender roles, it brings the, the ire of West German society. Um, and so, as I said, th there created this kind of tension and division between the two, uh, the two branches in the West German gay movement. Um, and eventually, as I said, there were there was this camp uh, that the Teutons said, "Look, y'all, y'all can pass as straight. Uh, you don't have to live openly as as gay or as different. Um, wh what would you? Let's figure out a way for you to live openly as gay, so that you can understand, right, how the rest of us who maybe are non gender conforming uh, have to live in in the society." So the idea was that uh, they would design a gay symbol. 
so if folks didn't want to dress or act like a tutan, um, you know, with the makeup, uh, with it's actually kind of almost like a, a milder form of drag, um, they could wear this gay symbol that would then bring visibility to them as, uh, as a gay person, but also as a member of this new gay political minority. And so the question really became, uh, what would the, this new gay symbol be, right? If there was gonna be a lot of importance for uh, how we would visibly uh, identify the, the gay community. And in 1972, a small publishing house in uh, Hamburg, Germany, published what was essentially the very first uh, account by a gay concentration camp survivor telling about what life was like for a gay person in, during the Holocaust. Uh, and you can see a picture of that book here on the left. It was called The Men with the Pink Triangle. Uh, and suddenly, the, the, these Tutan, the, the gender nonconforming uh, queens, um, had their answer. They said, okay, this is going to be the perfect symbol. Uh, we're going to reclaim it as not, you know, even though it originated as a mark of damnation, as a mark of shame and imprisonment, we're going to reclaim it as a positive marker of identity, of pride, and ultimately as liberation. And so you can see here on the, the, the right side picture on your screen, uh, are um, notes from the archives from the discussion in the 1970s in which the, uh, the Tutan of the West Berlin uh, gay movement are arguing for the pink triangle to become, uh, become the symbol of the gay rights movement. Uh, this, this vote in, the, in the, gay, um, the gay organization passes. And really by 1975, the pink triangle becomes kind of the a uh, major symbol of gay rights movement um, in Western Germany. One of the things I wanted to point out is that by that by that time, um, even though uh, even though gays and lesbians had originated um, as a you know very um, very much allied during the uh, gay rights movement, uh, by the nineteen mid nineteen seventies. Uh, lesbians uh, in this movement had, had realized that the leaders of the West German gay movement uh, really were focusing on issues uh, that were only related to essentially cisgender gay men. Um, and so what we see, which also happened in the United States to a, to a lesser extent, is um, the, ne the necessity for a lesbian separatist movement where uh, lesbians kind of broke off uh, and had to be the ones to um, advocate for issues that were directly relevant, not just to lesbians as um, you know gay people, but also as women. So that by the time the the pink triangle became a prominent symbol in the mid 1970s, uh, it really was a symbol that was predominantly used by um, white gay men there in Germany. Within months, um, this symbol spread across the, uh, across the Atlantic to the United States. Um, and you can see this is just one example of one of, of a button from the time period. Um, the pink triangle really fit American activists' uh, emphasis on um, the need to come out as well. Um, and this was also, uh, you know, became a moment in which, let's say by the 1970s and into the 1980s, uh, the pink triangle had become really the most widely recognizable symbol of a gay rights movement that was now not just in one particular nation, but was spreading you know, across um, North America and, and across Western Europe as well. So it was within that context uh, that a um, political, uh, sorry, a conservative political um, correspondent, William Buckley Jr., um, wrote in the New York Times, um, suggesting uh, that now during the, the AIDS crisis in the 1980s, um, anyone who was detected of, as having AIDS should be tattooed, um, labeling them as such. So clearly this, this brought uh, back memories of the Holocaust. And um, in 1986, six, uh, act, six artist activists in New York decided uh, to essentially clap back at Buckley. Uh, they designed their own um, symbol uh, to, to 
inspire the American LGBTQ community to become you know, more politically active. And they decided to use a Holocaust reference of their own as well. So they ended up designing uh, what became you know, a really iconic, famous poster, uh, Silence Equals Death. Um, the next year, within a few months, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power or ACT UP adopted the Pink Triangle. Um, and within a matter of, of years, the Pink Triangle um, became tied to not only gay activism, but AIDS activism across the world. So in the last, um, the last couple of minutes, I did want to just speak very briefly um, about the, the role of gender in um, not only in the, uh, the reclamation of the pink triangle as an activist symbol, but also in the memory uh, or in the memorialization rather of the Nazis LGBTQ victims. Um, the very first memorials that were dedicated to the Nazis LGBTQ victims like the one you see here, this was, uh, at least applied to be dedicated at Dachau in 1985, all focused or were dedicated to gay concentration camp prisoners. Um, and as Dr. Sexton mentioned, paragraph 175 um, only applied to men. And that is how men, you know, gay men were sent to concentration camps. So this, this uh, rhetorical focus on um, pink triangle prisoners, as well as paragraph 175, applied only to men. Um, therefore, the the um, memories that um, even though sometimes the, the the language would be about we're going to memorialize all of the Nazis LGBTQ victims, um, the focus of on this particular law and on this particular symbol meant that most of the research and the memorialization efforts focused on gay men. Uh, and I will just skip now to um, the discussion of one final memorial, uh, which you see here. It's called the Memorial Sphere or Gedenkkugel in German, uh, which was placed at Ravensbrück. Um, and what's unique about this particular memorial, uh, you can see it here kind of on the left side of the picture, is a, it's a concrete um, or clay rather, clay sphere. Um, it is dedicated to lesbian victims and it was the first kind of concrete memorial um, that was dedicated to lesbian victims. Uh, it was laid at, at Robins, Robinsbrook concentration camp for the first time in 2016. Um, but unfortunately, uh, the camp officials, the memorial officials uh, that run the Robinsbrook Memorial um, made the, the organizers of this particular memorial sphere remove it. They said, you can come, you can do a, a ceremony, but then you have to take uh, the memorial sphere away. And the reasoning was is that um, the advisory board of the memorial there at Robbins believed that lesbians were not um, officially persecuted by the Nazi regime because they weren't targeted with the particular law like paragraph 175 for gay men. Um, as you can imagine, this um, spurred a lot of debate about what do we mean by persecution? Is, is being targeted by a particular law the only way to be persecuted? Um, because clearly, even though lesbians weren't targeted with a particular law, uh, that doesn't mean that they weren't persecuted. They were persecuted in different ways. Uh, so this, um, as I said, it, it was started in 2016, uh, started a, a multi-year uh, debate, um, and it wasn't until last year, until 2021, that the Ravensbrück um, administration uh, finally decided that this uh, this a memorial sphere could be placed there permanently. And so for the very first time next year in April, sorry, next month in April, uh, this memorial to the lesbian victims of the Nazi regime will be placed now permanently at the Ravensbrück concentration camp. And so I just wanna end by, by um, you know, saying that while over the course of the years after the Holocaust, for most of the time, LGBTQ victims were marginalized and silenced, uh, but now in 2022, um, there has been a level of success um, in acknowledging the Nazis LGBTQ victims, but this has not been a, su a success that's been equally uh, shared by all. Um, as I mentioned, the focus on the scholarship of paragraph 175 and of the pink triangle prisoners really created this gendered memory that focused primarily on gay men. 
while lesbians and trans people and other queer people were continuously uh, marginalized in the, the, the public and, and um, historical narratives. Uh, I believe that really for memories to, to truly be liberating, um, they must be intersectional uh, and must be an honest confrontation with the past. So I'm gonna wrap it up there and thank you all for your attention and leave uh, a few minutes here at the end for, for Q&A, thank you. Thank you so much to both Dr. Newsom and Dr. Sexton. That was um, so thorough and enlightening. Um, I want to thank uh, Dr. Sexton for starting with clarification regarding the language and terminology. Um, I think that's very um, helpful to kind of foundationally have uh, shared language in terms of um, how we're using the terms. There were two questions um, that I wanted to try and pose before we wrap up for the session. Um, you know, one of them, Laura hinted at with her introduction to start the event. I was wondering if, um, and either or both of you could jump in with this. I was wondering if you could help us to understand the recent reemergence of backlash against this community in terms of the present cultural landscape in our country. And um, I kind of see this as part of a larger discussion um, in terms of this question of why are LGBTQ plus oftentimes persecuted within regimes as they move towards becoming increasingly radicalized? Why are they oftentimes in the front lines in terms of um, being targeted or persecuted? I'll, I'll take a stab at that, if, if you don't mind, uh, Danny. Um, I will just say that um, it's telling that uh, some of the very first prisoners that the Nazis sent to their concentration camps were LGBTQ people. Um, you know, they did this, and 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 Dr. Sexton um, kind of mentioned this and mentioned the work of Jeffrey Giles that really shows that the Nazis understood that. LGBTQ folks were a marginalized minority that most Germans um, would not necessarily feel empathy towards. And so actually the, the arrest and the campaign against LGBTQ uh, communities was a, essentially a way of coalition building for the Nazis. It was a way of signaling that even though you might not agree with maybe our policies against Jews or our policies on the economy, what we're doing is supposedly cleaning up um, the, the decaying morals of Germany. So it really was a way of, of shoring up supporters that might not have otherwise cast their vote for the Nazis. And I think that that is uh, still telling for today. Um, 2021 and now 2022 is on track to be the record for the worst years um, for anti-LGBTQ legislation in the United States. It's to me not surprising and it's not a coincidence that this coincides with uh, the rise of incredibly you know, further right-wing uh, political activism here in the United States. The, the same year you know, that we see um, folks storming the Capitol uh, is, is also this idea that, you know, don't say gay in Florida, all of these different bills that are being um, not only proposed, but passed across the United States go hand in hand with this, this right wing shift, uh, because essentially it's a dog whistle. It is a way for the right to consolidate itself um, and kind of gloss over maybe differences that, that would keep, that would, that would faction um, these different groups. And so I, I think it happened historically and it's very clear that it's happening again today. Thank you for that. You know, when I have discussions regarding, um, you know, the recent legislation, you, you mentioned an example of one in Florida with friends and family. I always tell them, if you think that this is the group that is going to be the only group <laughs> that's persecuted, it's just a start. And, and that to me is even sad that sometimes we have to preface that conversation like that, but it's because of what you're saying as well, because oftentimes these are groups that we are accustomed to seeing them under siege, right? And so it might not necessarily evoke empathy in all voters, or we might have this feeling of like, oh, but that doesn't have to do with me if we're not part of that community or if we don't 
perceive ourselves as allies to that community. But that, you know, that that oftentimes is just the first step in a larger campaign of targeting and oppressing others, I think um, is very significant to recognize. And so this is a good segue into the final question that I have seeing that our time is winding down. But, you know, as both of you were speaking, I was thinking about when we learn about the concentration camp system, it's really not commonly known the extent to which the LGBTQ plus community were persecuted under this regime. Um, a lot of times when I mention in my class that homosexuals were persecuted, for instance, students are very surprised or they have follow-up questions. Um, and not only under the regime, but then also the post war continued, um, you know, oppression and criminalization is oftentimes not acknowledged. I suppose my question is, why do you think we continue to have these historical blindsides? And why isn't there more of an acknowledgement in terms of the larger kind of Holocaust or post-war narrative? I, I, I'd like to take a, a stab at that because I think what happened, and I think Jake, Dr. Newsom spoke about this a bit, um, when the camps were liberated, um, a lot of those homosexual men were, um, they had to complete their, their sentence because paragraph 175 existed before the Nazis. And I think for a lot of them, there was a fear of voicing their experiences because they thought, you know, I can, I can receive pushback from this. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's also this notion of, of how we perceive victimology, you know, uh, who was a victim, who has a right to be a victim. And I think that has a lot to do with, it because even like a lot of the documented stories, a lot of them come years afterwards. Um, and so I just think we didn't, we, didn't, we didn't have those narratives or oftentimes even in oral history, those narratives got subverted by the questions that were often being answered. And so, and I, I don't know if this was always done deliberately, but interviews would almost unconsciously turn the story or the oral histories away from that and re redirect them. Um, so I think we, I, I like to think that those, they I mean, I know they existed and I don't know if they, we still have them. I just think a lot of them may have been lost for that reason. Thank you so much. Jake, any final thoughts before we wrap up for the afternoon? I think I think Dr. Sexton did a good job of of uh, encapsulating what, what I was what I would have said too. So I, I I agree with that. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, take a look in the chat for more resources, including um, links to Dr. Newsom's. Um, uh, resources and things like that. And just to answer one of the questions in the chat that was asking about uh, access to a recording, um, we will edit and offer closed captioning. And then when you go to the KHC's website and see the calendar of events, the recording will be posted and made available for those of you that want to revisit this. I just want to take another moment to thank uh, both of our speakers for offering insight and um, such a thorough overview with the limited amount of time that we had. So thank you both for that. And um, I'm hopeful that we can have, uh, you know, future collaborations uh, at the center here to dive deeply because, um, you know, I think there's just so much more that we could discuss. So I will say this conversation is to be continued. Thank you so much to both of you. And um, happy, happy spring day to everyone. Take care. Thank you.